keeping your oil clean. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But oil is also a symbol of the anointing of God. And oil is also a symbol of life and what keeps things running. And so when you think about your automobile, something as practical as that, you can't just assume and keep driving it and assume that the oil's just gonna be there full all the time and not run out. In fact, I can say as a parent that we lost a couple of vehicles. I won't say who was responsible, but the person driving was not checking the oil to see if there was oil in there. And so ultimately, burnout took place and the vehicle was total and the engine was destroyed. That's a high price for forgetting about oil, isn't it? In your vehicle. It's a high price. If you forget it, it could cost you the entire vehicle. In the same way though, we're supposed to stay full of oil. Keep your oil full, but not just keep it full, keep your oil clean. Because if your oil is full, then you will run well and you will be healthy and things will be good. And sometimes we have situations where we need an oil change. And that's what the communion is about, is the Lord says, do that. How often did he say to do it? As often as you eat and drink, do this in remembrance of me. And so unforgiveness, as an example, is one of the impurities that tries to pollute your oil. And that's why in the Bible it says, we are not ignorant of this. You cannot afford to hold a grudge and you cannot afford to stay in unforgiveness. That will pollute your oil. And sometimes people say, well, I forgive everybody, but I'm just mad. If you're still mad, there's somebody that needs to be forgiven. Because I, I've talked to people before and they say, I'm just mad. No, it doesn't work that way. You're not just mad. You're mad at somebody. And sometimes people are mad at the way their life is and they're mad at God, but they don't realize that's who they're really mad at. They just say, I'm just mad right now. There's no such thing as being just mad. In fact, the Bible says there's a reason for everything and that everything that happens, happens for a reason. So there's no such thing. This, if we are disconnected from our own self, we won't be able to get it right. Because when people are disconnected from this, themselves, they'll, they'll say things like this. I'm just in a bad mood. I'm just in a bad mood. Like bad moods just pop up out of nowhere. Or saying, I'm just mad. No, it doesn't work that way. There's a reason for everything. If you don't know the reason, seek your heart, search your heart, and search God, and he'll reveal it to you. And then you can deal with it. But if you don't even know, you can't deal with it. And many people are walking around wounded, walking around angry, walking around discouraged, uh, walking around disillusioned, disappointed, and they don't know why. And when you don't know why, guess who has the advantage? When you don't know what's bothering you or what you're dealing with, who has the advantage? The Bible says right here, we'll read it again. You can just, uh, right there is good. Um, it says that we forgive everyone, and it says, it says to do it, uh, for Christ's sake, too. Forgive everyone and for your own sake. But then it says, we do this so that Satan does not get an advantage over us because we are not ignorant of his devices. So sometimes things are not what they appear. Sometimes it's not about the problem. It's about our attitude. Because Everybody has problems, but you'll see people who have problems who are overcomers. 
because their attitude is good. And then you'll see other people that are stuck because they can't get past the problem and they're just staying mad. They're just mad, I'm just mad, I'm just upset. But we're not supposed to stay there. It's, I'm not saying we should not be human. Getting upset and getting angry or disappointed, that's human. But the Bible says not to stay there. And that's why in the Bible it says, if you become angry or upset, don't let your anger become sin. When that happens, your oil becomes polluted. It becomes gunky and junky. And then you can't run well through life. It's interesting to think about this because the Bible says we're to run the race that is set before us. It says, and it says to set aside every weight that would slow us down from moving forward as quickly as we can. And it says in the Bible, don't run the race and say it doesn't matter if I win or not. It says run the race to win. And so when you're running this race of life, and you know, as you go down this road, there's going to be potholes. Sometimes there's going to be construction. And there's going to be obstacles. But the key is we keep going forward because God said to always move forward. Don't look back. Don't turn back. Don't spend time looking in the rear view mirror. Keep looking forward. That's why all the armor that God has given us in the Bible is forward armor. It's helmet, breastplate, all that stuff, the sword, but it's a moving forward armor. There's no armor for your backside. And the reason there's no armor for your backside is because God has never intended you to run away from the devil or run away from your problems. You're supposed to move forward strong in faith, facing whatever is coming your way and keep going forward. So we think about this and we, we sometimes we have a hard time because we are ignorant of the word of God. This is why the time you're spending right now to hear the word of God, you are making a, a huge, important deposit and investment for your future. Because if things are smooth right now, that is great. But... As we go down the road, like I said, there's going to be times when you're going to need the Word of God. You're going to need it to overcome whatever obstacles or construction or things that are or, or distractions that are trying to get you off the road from going forward. Sometimes people can be distractions and you're trying to go forward and saying, wait, stop, come over here and talk to me and uh, let me prevent you from running your race, basically. I'm not saying we shouldn't help people, but you'll know it by the fruits. And if you're not moving forward with God, then you, you need to consider these things as distractions because the Lord says to keep moving forward. So his word, his word says this, and this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. This is something that we really, really need to get in our spirit. The Bible is full of promises from God. All kinds of promises. But if we don't even know what the promises are, again, we could be ignorant. And what does it say in this the second chapter? That we are not ignorant of the enemy's devices. We're not ignorant. And so what does it say about the promises of God? For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are amen, unto the glory of God by us. That is a huge, huge statement. It's not a little statement. There's nowhere where God promises he won't do something. He always promises what he will do. And if we understand this, then here's some examples. All the promises of God are yes, 
and amen. And you know, amen is another version of yes. And this is why in the church, amen, right? We say amen. We all say amen. amen. And it's not just saying yes to sound cool, like, oh, I'm a Christian, amen. When you say amen, it's to be in agreement with God and his promises because all the promises of God are yes and amen. So when you say amen, you need to say it at the right time. Because if you say it at the wrong time, you're going to look like a fool. And I'll give you an example. One time I was at a gathering with a bunch of pastors and this guy was uh, preaching and he was yelling and saying his stuff. And the guy sitting next to me was kind of being a spiritual lunkhead. And he just, every time the pastor said something, go, amen. You know, and, and this kept going on for about a half hour. And I'm sitting next to here. The preacher says something. And then the guy next to me goes, amen. And so then the, the pastor said this. A lot of people are going to hell. And then the guy sitting next to me yells out, Amen! And I turned and looked at him. You saying Amen to that? And he looked at me and he goes, Oops! <laughs> because we don't just do stuff. We, God gave us a brain, you know, so we can think about what we're doing. So when you say Amen, what does it say? All the promises of God are yes, and the promises of God are amen. When you say amen, what that's supposed to be is not that you're trying to impress anybody or just sound good. You're, you're agreeing with God and his promises. Do you see the context of the word amen? It's in the context of the promises of God. So here's an example. In the word of God, God says, yes, I will heal you. Amen. Yes, I will provide all your needs. Amen. Yes, I have chosen you. Amen. Yes, I have anointed you. Amen. Yes, I will give you all the grace you need. Amen. Yes, my joy will give you strength. Amen. And we agree with all these things that God said. So if you're feeling down, what do you do? You say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. Things seem to be going terrible. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. If it seems like it's too much to handle, you say, what the word of God says in Corinthians 10, God won't give you anything you can't handle. Amen. So you keep doing this and keep agreeing with God. You're agreeing with God and what God said. Now, you know what the problem was through the Old Testament? The Old Testament is a record of people not doing it right. Most of us don't realize. They say, why do you even have the Old Testament if you got the New Testament? It's a record of people not doing it right. Starting right at Genesis, they didn't do it right. They didn't obey God. They ate the forbidden fruit. And then you go all the way through, and you have this document of people not doing it right. Why, did, why was that recorded? It says in the New Testament that God preserved the Old Testament, not so that we would try to live by the Old Testament, but that we would learn from the mistakes all those people made in the Old Testament. And the biggest mistake that was made was not being in agreement with God and not saying amen to what God has given us and his promises. So one of the first promises in the Bible is the promised land. That's in the Old Testament. God promised this land to his people. And that's why it's called the promised land. The promise came from God. And it's very interesting because if you don't think you have a part in where you end up, then listen to this next thing. Because a lot of people say, well, I don't have any say in anything. It is not up to me. Actually, you have a huge part in where you 
and uh, because in the Bible, I'm going to give you the short version today because we don't need to go real long. We just need to get the principle. In the Bible, as God was taking his chosen people, and you are his chosen people today in the New Testament, you are the New Testament chosen of God. As he was taking his chosen people to the promised land, there were a bunch of people that said, we can't go to the promised land. It's too hard. What are they doing? They're not believing what God has promised them. I mean, that's just putting it simple. They're refusing to believe. Now, that particular generation, there were two people, Joshua and Caleb, who said, we can do this. We can enter the promised land. And here's the fascinating thing of the story, the short version. Those who believed that they would enter the promised land entered the promised land. Those who did not believe that they would enter the promised land did not enter the promised land. So here's my question. Did God want all of them to enter into the promised land? Yes. Yeah, he did. But only those who believed made it into the promised land. And so this believing thing is huge. Jesus said, only believe and you shall have what you ask. There is one clause though, believing according to God's will. And so if you're believing for something that is against God's will, no, you're not going to get that. If you're praying to ask God to kill somebody, you can forget that prayer. Because God already said in his word, thou shall not kill. So you see, we have to know the word so we can pray properly. But if you're needing healing, you believe for healing, and it says you shall have it. And even if it takes a while, you still shall have it. If you're believing for restoration, if if your finances or things have been drained and you need restoration and replenishing, you believe for these things. And so the challenge then will be this. Will we keep going back to God's word and believing what God says, even when the circumstances don't look favorable, even when the situation doesn't look well at all? Are we going to believe what God says? Because I found this very interesting in the Word of God. Let's just flip over to Peter. This was not pre-planned by me because I didn't have this scripture marked. But this is the problem with most people. <laughs> You go, let's, let's first go to 2 Peter. And it says what the problem is. In 2 Peter, and you get to the very end of it, chapter 3, verse 5. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you willingly ignorant? Are you willingly ignorant? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. It says, for this they willingly are ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The day of judgment, this kind of judgment, is for people who willingly don't want to know God. They don't want to know God. They don't want to know the Bible. They don't want to know the truth. 
And when you look at the end of the Bible, those that didn't make it into heaven, one of the qualities, it doesn't say they made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Nobody could be perfect enough to make it into heaven. Only Jesus. And through Jesus, we make it in. But the Bible says that the people that didn't make it in, it says they loved a lie. They loved lies. And where did the lies come from? The father of lies. And so, loving the truth, loving God's word, loving what God says, and not sitting trying to argue with what God says. This is the key. Because you can argue with God all you want, but the Bible says, God says, I am the Lord and I will do what I please. So we don't sit there and try to duke it out with God, like we're on the level with him or something. God said what he said, and you can love the truth or love a lie. You get to choose that. And if you want to enter in to your promised land that God has for you, then you need to love the truth, love God's word, and not be willingly ignorant. Remember, willingly ignorant can just be driving your car, not checking your oil, not checking your gas gauge. And I don't know if anybody in this room has ever run out of gas on the road. You just, you, uh, it says I'm on empty, I better get some gas, but I'm gonna stretch it here. And then next thing you know, you're on the side of the road. That's willingly ignorant. Not checking the oil, willingly ignorant. Staying angry in unforgiveness, willingly ignorant. Because the Bible says if you, if you stay in anger and unforgiveness, then you give opportunity to the enemy. And so, before we take the communion, I want you to think about this. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, that was a symbol of that the Lord will cleanse us, right? The Lord himself cleansing us. The Lord himself giving us a blood bath. Because it says the blood of Jesus washes away all our sin. So no, this isn't about horror flicks. The blood, the precious pure blood of Jesus washing away our sin. Only his blood can do it because all the other people's blood is what we call bad blood. Blood full of flaws in forgiveness. It's not pure blood. And when the blood's polluted, the person can't live forever. But through the blood of Jesus, his pure blood, we get a blood transfusion, we get to live forever. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. So why did he wash the feet. Why didn't he wash our face? Why didn't he wash our hands? Peter decided he's going to have an argument with Jesus and he said, I don't want you just washing my feet, Jesus. I want you to give me the works. Give me the works. Wash me totally. Jesus said, no, I'm just washing your feet. Just your feet. So the question is, why just the feet? Because God knew that we would sin again, mess up again, continue to make mistakes, and the feet represent that because how long is it gonna take for their feet to get dirty again? Jesus washed their feet and they go out walking, and most of them are wearing sandals, so that's not gonna keep your feet very clean. I notice my feet get the dirtiest when I'm wearing sandals or walking barefoot. But the point is, he knew we were going to mess up again and again and again. He knew this. Nothing is a surprise to God. We're so shocked when we mess up. I can't believe I messed up again. I, I can't believe it. And God's like, 
really? Did you overrate yourself? Do you really uh, think you're better than you are? It's no surprise to Jesus. No surprise at all. He knows every mistake we're ever going to make before we do. But here's the thing. There's no time with God. That's why the cross is the date zero. So he has already forgiven and cleansed you of past, present, and future sins. Can you receive it? Because that's what we're going to do now when we take the communion. Receive that full forgiveness. That full forgiveness. And so don't do the roller coaster version of being a Christian where when you're doing good, you're at the top and you're, ah, I'm doing really good. And, and, then, and then when you mess up, you go down the hill and you're about at the bottom of the hill and say, I don't know if I'm really a Christian. Because when you do that, you are rating your relationship with God based on what you are doing and not what Jesus did. And our relationship needs to be on what Jesus did. It says that Jesus is the last priest and he is a priest forever. So he forever forgives us, forever cleanses us, and forever prays for us. You ready to take the communion? Let's do this. And remember, you do this by faith. We do this by faith. If you don't get goosebumps, it's okay. If you don't get the chills, if you feel nothing, it's okay because we do this by faith. And so let's all stand up as we, we take this. And Lord, we come before you this morning. We know we're not perfect and we're not going to fake it till we make it. We, we know that you are the one who is perfect and you are perfecting us through what you did. So by grace now and through the taking of the communion, we confess our sins to you. We admit to you we're not perfect and that we make mistakes. But we also proclaim that it's getting better every day and you are transforming us into your glory and your image by faith. And we receive it now by faith. Let's just say this in the name of Jesus. Just proclaim it out loud. Lord, I forgive everyone. I ask you to forgive me too. I forgive myself. And I receive the full anointing and blessing from your communion by faith. Thank you, for me. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Okay, I'm going to close with a song, and um, also Kathy may have a couple of